Welcome everyone to the Center for Innovative Practices Supervisors Learning Collaborative. Um, some of you are probably just here because of that email that came out this morning about going over all of the alphabet soup that we're all cooking in right now. Um, of all those acronyms and what services belong where and why and how do we make these decisions and those sorts of things. So we thought it might be most efficient if we uh, had a little panel of our CIP experts and um, talk a little bit about it, look through those documents that I sent you this morning and then just open it up for questions to see uh, what's happening out there and what do you, what do you need to know. Now, I just want to warn you, if you get into the weeds about just your agency, um, and we all work within our agencies, of course, but we do have available consultation time to talk to you specifically about your situation if that's needed. So we're going to try to keep uh, the information as global as possible, understanding that the truth is Collaboration is really the, the key to the game here as we move forward. And we all need to understand what we're all doing in all the different regions and counties and, and what's gonna be best to lift all of the children and families in our state. Um, so that said, uh, we do have, uh, yeah, about 35 people online right now. So for those of you who have spent a lot of time with us in this particular meeting, we usually are a little bit smaller group and we do some check-ins and things like that, but we're gonna jump right into our content today. Um, and so, hi everyone, let's just all together. Hello, nice to see you all. <laughs> and, um, and let me introduce our CIP folk so you'll know who's um, speaking up here. First of all, let me start with Michael Fox. Uh, Mike, you want to say, uh, say hello and what your role is? Uh, hi, uh, Mike Fox. I, I work uh, primarily considering uh, integrated care for adolescents. Thanks, Michael. Kim? Uh, hi, I'm the uh, Kim. I'm the IHBT quality manager and manage the fidelity reviews uh, for all of you. Um, many of you know me, and those of you that don't may know me soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you very much. And our esteemed leader, Rick Shepler. Hey, folks. Rick here. <laughs> No opening jokes, Rick? <laughs> Not today. Not today. There is no humor today. Oh, no. That is sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I think most of you know me because you get emails from me. My name is Bobby Beal, and uh, I work with these fine people. We do have a few other people on staff with us, um, but we're the ones you get today. And so um, I think we probably just want to jump into it and talk about, uh, I, Kim can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the most frequent questions we're getting right now is how do we pick which intensive service or services should we be doing in our community at our agency? And, um, and honestly, I wish we had uh, uh, one of our newest staff members, um, and I'm hesitating to say her name because I can only think Heather, What's Heather's last name? Dust Distin. Oh my God. I know, I know. So still have COVID brain here. Did anyone think that you're out of the pandemic? Cause you're not. And uh, it's still happening. But Heather uh, has a succinct way of talking about um, one of the things that needs to happen is um, not just what can your agency do, but what does your community need in terms of types of services? and amounts of service provision. And uh, thinking about that and, and the fact that some of you are occupying regions and counties where there are multiple agencies and doubling up is not gonna help us necessarily unless you have that, uh, that many referrals just pouring in. And so thinking about how we can all be in the game, doing the right thing and, um, and making it work for everybody, including our workers, 
uh, the, the, where we're going to discuss this as if we have a sufficient workforce to do the things that we're about to discuss. And the truth is the workforce issue it looms large as well. Um, and maybe next quarter we'll have a, a webinar just about workforce issues. But for today, we're going to look at um, trying to make decisions around our home and community-based practices. So Rick, can I just turn it over to you to launch us with some comments about what we have available? And I have ready to go both of those documents that I can put on the screen if you wanna speak directly to them. Yeah, I'll make a few comments and then I'll open it up. I think it's gonna be really most important for you guys to ask all the questions you have. Um, I will just kind of give you the overview of, um, you know, you guys, probably already have this, but we've got a, a number of major initiatives going on at the same time um, in Ohio, and they touch on IHBT, they touch on MST, uh, FFT, uh, and a number of other initiatives. The key initiatives that I think are most important for us to think about are the, are the Ohio Rise initiatives and, and the Family First initiative, which is the um, child welfare uh, initiative where they're using 4E dollars to pay for prevention services. And those prevention services that they chose that affect us are MST and FFT. Um, they also in that in continuum have included um, um, Ohio Start, um, and then two home visiting programs, uh, parents as teachers, and I don't know what the other one is, but it doesn't matter because we're not doing them. So um, by the end of the meeting, I'm sure I'll remember what the hell it was. Um, but what's important to us is to consider how does MST and FFT included in Family First affect us as providers or does it affect us as providers? Um, that's one piece. The other piece that we've been getting questions on is, um, you know, with the new rules in IHBT, what are some of the changes that have impact on us? Um, in particular, the inclusion of this new hybrid service um, and so some of the confusion that we're getting is, so do we have to do MST? Should we do MST? Is it advisable? <laughs> uh, and, you know, does that mean that we're not doing IHBT anymore? So the, the short answer to that question is, um, no, you don't have to do MST. You can do MST if that's something that you choose to do as a, and it makes sense to you. And you can do FFT, you can do a whole array of different other services, um, but nothing is required in Ohio Rise that says you have to now do MST. The main funder of what you do is gonna be Ohio Rise, not family first, okay? Family first basically says, if the child is not on Medicaid and does not qualify for Ohio RISE, there is another reimbursement pathway through some money they set aside, i.e. the kids on insurance has an open case with Family First, a child welfare agency, um, we have done a thorough examination of those kiddos. It's a small, minute amount of kiddos, right? So we did research on all the kids that are getting MSD currently that don't have Medicaid or are not qualifying for BHJJ. It was one kid, okay? So they would qualify for those additional funds through, um, actually it goes through us, through the Child Children's Alliance. It's JFS uh, funds that they sent to us. Uh, and that's what you would get. So I'm not so sure why you would think about it unless you wanted to do that. 
unless your local child welfare agency said to you, I want you to do MST. We're going to work with you on this. We're going to make sure that you have a contract with us. Oh, and by the way, you can pull down these extra dollars through the Children's Alliance. Okay. So that's the family first. It's created a lot of confusion about, oh my gosh, we have to do now do MST. And, and, and the short answer is no, that's not correct. You can do MST if you choose to do it and you have a reason to do it. Um, Ohio Rise is going to be your major funder. It funds IHBT as an umbrella service. Underneath it are MST, FFT, IHBT as we know it, and a new hybrid service that allows you to have a licensed staff and a teamed other, which is a QBHS or a peer support staff. So that's the major thing that I wanted to start with. Um, not much else has changed. If you're doing integrated co-occurring treatment, that still falls under IHBT. If you're doing a model like, you know, um, another promising practice or evidence-supported practice that qualifies for IHBT, you can still bill IHBT. So nothing has really changed. If you're currently certified to deliver IHBT, you will remain certified to deliver IHBT as long as you are meeting the fidelity. Questions for a minute, I'll stop. I have a question real quick. Um, when you were just talking about the hybrid um, peer support staff, um, can you do that in IHBT or is that a different program? It's going to be within the IHBT role. So you so would that, be billing IHBT um, and getting reimbursed at a slightly different rate. Are there things that they have to do to qualify for that? There would be a separate fidelity review for that. Um, and it's very similar to the core IHBT rule, except it's a team of two folks teaming um, the same cases. In other words, you would have the same kiddos that you would be serving. Um, you would have higher, you could have higher caseloads um, and you could have a QBHS or a peer support. We wanted to leave it open for you guys to be able to go find folks along with your licensed staff. Yeah. I'd also, hang on one second, Nicole. I'd also like to mention that there's probably, and we're still working out the kinks on all of this, going to be an increased training component for that. So because we're dealing with people who don't have, uh, you know, clinical licenses, we want to make sure that we're giving them a lot of information and support to implement some, um, to implement interventions with the family. And so the, there's probably going to be a pretty significant um, training component that goes along with that. And once they have that training component, then they'd be, uh, they would fit, it'll be required through the fidelity that they would have to have that in order to implement IHBT at their level. When are we, when are we able to start those fidelities for that program? It's a good question. Um, so the other piece is that the, the new implementation date for Ohio Rise is July 1st. They're, what they were doing was finishing all the rules, the new rules, which are not in place yet, um, to coincide with the start date, which would have, was January 1st. It is now July 1st. We understand, this is my understanding today, that the new rules will coincide with the July 1st date, which means fidelity for those rules would match up with that. It doesn't mean we can't do fidelity ahead of time. There's just not a way to get reimbursed for that service unless you're doing it unbundled until then. So these, all the rules that are going to happen are not going to start until July 1st of 22. That is my current understanding, and I could absolutely be wrong on that. Ideally, uh, that date sticks, and um, as we move into the new year, 
we would start rolling those trainings out so that you could be hiring and getting staff up and running, ready to go, um, and possibly billing unbundled things until you could they engage that whole uh, project. Do we know how many IHBT certified programs we have in Ohio? Yes, we do, Kim. 32 at the moment. How many? 32. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ellen. Hello. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you're not a certified IHBT provider, are you not able to provide intensive services under Ohio Rise for kids and families? Under Ohio Rise, they designate IHBT, MRSS, and intensive care coordination and moderate care coordination as the services included in that package. Um, so if kids qualify and they start to get intensive care coordination, um, what gets paid for in that package are those services. So I, that's a, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a great question, Tori. I think, I think the answer is you have to be IHPT certified. Before July next year. Yeah. To get those to be included in the Ohio Rise package, which has those rates, IHPT has not been included outside of Ohio Rise. Um, for kids that aren't in Ohio Rise, you can do whatever you think is the right thing. So, you know, we know that you have a tremendously high quality program that you've been doing for literally decades that we don't want to lose in the system of care, especially in Butler. Um, so I, I think it begs a lot of questions. I think we're going to have to talk that one through. Um, but yes, I think right now it, you have to be IHPT certified to get the Ohio Rise to be included in that package. Okay. So, Thank so you. What, what does that mean for our county? Um, as far as I know, we don't have any certified IHBT programs. So I guess that's piggybacking back on what Tori is saying. So what happened to those kids if we don't have that service in our county, a certified service in our county? What happens to those kids? Well, I think what Aetna is going to want to do is to make sure that they're charged with making sure every county has access to those core services listed in Ohio Rise. And so, um, you know, you know, using, you know, Butler just as the example, um, there would be, a, you know, I, you know, Butler Behavioral would have a choice, you know, to make. They're like a minute away from being certified just because they do high quality work. And if they chose to get certified, it would be probably not much of a problem. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just, it's bec it became a technical, it's a technical issue. The same flexibility that we had before without Ohio Rise, will not exist post Ohio Rise. It's, it's just one of the realities. That's my best take. And I, you know. Rick, could you explain that a little more clearly, please? The same flexibility we had, we will not have. Can you speak a little bit more about what you understand that to mean, please? I, I couldn't hear you. Could you say it again, please? I said, could you explain a little bit more clearly what you mean by loss of flexibility, what you understand that to mean? And who is talking right now? It looks like Rebecca Wixon. What county are you with, Rebecca? She may have frozen up though. Delaware, she says, yes, Delaware. Thank you. So 
the flexibility we have currently is you can provide, we have a number of high quality programs providing home-based services to families utilizing individual and family approaches. Um, they are quite good, but they might not be aligned with the IHBT rule itself. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, uh, why folks have chosen not to do that. Uh, with the behavioral health redesign, um, there was incentives to actually continue to do this, these kinds of services unbundled because there were, you know, you could use different kinds of staff, you could use crisis modifier codes that we didn't have in IHBT, you could bill phone calls, which we couldn't do in IHBT, um, you could bill for prolonged service hours through counseling psychotherapy, which we couldn't do. So there was a disincentive for folks to come forward to, to get certified. Um, and so, you know, folks could, there were lots of options. So when I say um, the flexibility of doing those options changes, what I mean by that is if your kid is high acuity and they qualify for Ohio Rise and they get those services, Ohio Rise becomes the payer. Because they become the payer, they're, and they're obligated to the services they're obligated to, which are IHBT, MRSS, intensive care coordination, and moderate care coordination, um, and PRTF, psychiatric rehabilitations, you know, treatment facilities. Um, so what's ever included in the package, it's a, a package of service. This is managed care. Um, and then IHBT as the name service, you know, that it, you would then have to become certified for that named service to get reimbursed under Ohio Rise under that package. I don't know if that helped, Rebecca. Yes, thanks. Any other questions out there? Any questions about either the documents that we sent about the, de the, the decision tree about those services or? <clears throat> Bobby, this is Eve Gellner from the Village Network. Um, Eve. Just kind of a clarifying question, I guess, still trying to wrap my head around this, but so if we, if you currently have a team that's certified IHBT, Mm -hmm. It's not, we're not FFT or MST, IHBT. Okay. And you choose to then uh, become, say, FFT trained. Okay. Do, you, do you maintain the IHBT certification and also instill the fidelity and all of that um, for IHBT and the fidelity that FFT requires? That's how, that's how it's right now, uh, because FFT is just a, a type of family therapy, right? Okay. Um, and so that's currently how it is. But I believe as we move forward, uh, because they're more formally included, FFT and MST, uh, it'll be their fidelity um, okay. requirements. But Rick, can, is that correct? Can you clarify that? You said it perfectly. So once July 1st hits and that rule starts, um, FFT is included in a sense as an exception. <laughs> um, and and you, you just have to follow FFT fidelity. So in other words, that means you just have to be licensed by them. Because they do their own fidelity, MST does their own fidelity, and we're trying to match up the rule to, to, to say that, right? Um, so that'll be one of the benefits for the teams that are doing MST and FFT moving forward. They wouldn't have to go through the IHBT Fidelity Review. As of today. Thank you. Because who knows what's going to change in the next week, two months, three months. It's so true. When you said you were trying to get your head wrapped around all this, I thought, well, take a breath because it'll be new <laughs> next week and it is hard to keep up with these things yes yes it yeah, is. literally we're in the we're in conversations this morning about all of this stuff so it's not i wish i could be more concrete i'm trying to 
I'm letting you know where things are at today based on what I know and what I can predict. So can I ask a, another clarifying question? Could FFT still like bill under an uh, unbundled service and not become like a payer of Ohio Rise? <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Me neither. We have an FFT program. That's Buckeye Ranch. That's why I'm just asking. Yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Um, hmm. Okay. My understanding is once July 1st hits and those new rules go into effect, because FFT got included in Ohio Rise under IHP, uh, included under the IHPT rule, I don't know that you can do it outside of Ohio Rise. Oh boy. Which is weird because, I mean, FFT is also an office-based treatment model. I mean. I understand. These are some of the things that we, um, this, Nicole, here's the right answer. Ready? Why, Nicole? That's a very sure. good question. I'm really glad you asked. <laughs> We're going to have to take that forward and have a discussion yeah. about that. We'll get back to you soon. This is this is Renee. I'm assuming because our FFT team has contracts with the court, so I'm assuming they could do it would look different depending on their contract with the court. Um, and our FFT our FFT team is in the community; they're not in the office doing treatment. Well, thank you for that additional comment, Renee. We'll take that forward. <laughs> um. So here's what gets complicated, right? You've got FFT and MST right now that are included in many BHJJ contracts, right? Or, or grants. Mm -hmm. And there's also court contracts and there's other, you know. All we're talking about is Medicaid reimbursement for these things, right? So if you have separate contracts and separate funding, you're good to go. It doesn't matter. Okay, um, but if you're wanting Medicaid funding at those Medicaid rates that they came up with specifically for FFT, you have to be IHBT certified. That's the tricky part, right? But you're saying you could do it unbundled if you want, if you can, if you're okay with doing it at a different rate, or that's the part you don't know. It's a little gray. Okay. Nicole, I'm, I'm a bit bothered by the fact that you're, <laughs> with your persistence and your questioning. I'm just help, trying to help my program, my other friends program out, you know, make sure we're doing everything no, Nicole, all right. Nicole, your questions are really good. Other people have had the same questions, many of them the same, exactly the same thing. So yes, you're good. <laughs> good. Oh. Oh, and it feels like we're talking about, you know, kind of this, nobody wants to, it's not the fact that we don't want to do these services or that we're disinterested in IHBT certification of its many sort of constructs. Um, it's just the, the limits that are set in these rules make it very difficult to do that without being able to break even, staff it, actually not have a crazy, I and mean, we have a crazy wait list now that our wait lists would go just completely bonkers. Um, so I just want to make sure the tone of this is not a, kind of an abstract, it has nothing to do with that. I think we all are interested in kind of playing on the same team. It's just as somebody that has to create um, a program in its entirety to make sure that we at least, you know, as a nonprofit are able to manage it. it it's been very difficult. So I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of others are kind of in the same boat of trying to figure out how we can make this work in the spirit that it's kind of intended and still be able to stay in business, so. We support that kind of take, Tori. I mean, I think we want the services to continue regardless. I mean, one of the first things uh, my, my feedback was why isn't IHBT allowed outside of Ohio Rise? 
Um, cause I didn't understand that. I still don't understand that. Um, and, um, that's the key issue here, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other key issue, no, it's not the only key issue. That's one of the key issues. The other thing is, is that this is an eligibility based benefit, Ohio rise. And so once you get in, you can't go to another managed care company. You get paid by Aetna. You get paid by Ohio Rise and, and the benefit that's included with Ohio Rise. And that is technically the words IHBT. And so I would argue, not argue, I would probably guess that many of our kids are going to get into Ohio Rise. And so there's that's another rub. So that's why I'm framing it this way. It's like, I can't think of another way to frame it. And I appreciate, you know, look, I mean, you have been great at putting together such a high quality service and um, it's been extremely effective. I don't want that to go away. You know, I just don't know if, you, if you're not doing IHPT, how you can get. So if a kid goes, for example, gets into Ohio Rise, let's say they have a crisis, MRSS goes out, they get a CAN score and the CAN score gets them into Ohio Rise, basically it's be eligibility based. The family can turn it down, but otherwise they're going in, right? Once they go in, they would only have access to the services Ohio Rise is, you know, is approved. So that's kind of the, you know, I, I see that happening quite a bit. Once they get in, it's like, okay, they're getting all this care management, they're getting, you know, they want them to have access to IHBT, but they don't have a way to pay for it if it's not cer a certified service. So Rick, does that mean that um, like Children's Services has family preservation? Does that go away? What happens to programs like family preservation? Well, family preservation, it depends on, it, it depends on, can you give me an example of that before you answer? Like, well, I know our children's service, sometimes they put family preservation to keep families together. I'm not sure how they decide who gets that service or not, but I know that they provide that service to families. So that doesn't go away if, if who's providing it? Is it children's services or an, a contracted agency? Ch children's services, I believe. Tori, am I calling it the right thing? It's called family preservation, isn't it? it? Is. I'm guessing what it is, and this is my guess because I do not run that program, obviously, but I do remember when it was bid out. It's partially paid for by children's services, and all, for, you know, if kids have Medicaid, they're billing Medicaid, and then, you know, the kind of firehousey aspect of the model is paid for by children's services, so it's probably a hybrid. Okay. But who provides it, Tori? Um, a mental health agency. I mean, they're contracted. So it's a contracted service. Yeah. So Maybe that's Presley a good Ridge? Presley Ridge, but I know that they bill Medicaid for all, okay. pretty much everything. And then there's some, you know, funding from children's services for what Medicaid doesn't cover. So in that circumstance, if that child getting family prez um, qualifies for Ohio Rise, you know, it's a conundrum. Yeah. Right. Unless it's ironic that it may be a barrier to services, you know, this program. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So this is, these are great points. And I, I'm going to take them forward while we're still, you know, having all these detailed conversations about this um, so that we can represent those points of view so that they're heard clearly. And I think, Tori, that last comment was a good one. You know, it's ironic that the way that this is structured could actually uh, limit some of the services that are currently out there, access to them. Well, ironically, for the kids that need them the most, you know, I mean, I mean it's meant to be for the kids that have the most severe. Mm -hmm. Rick, we had a question in the chat. Are they going to require parents to change their MCO from CareSource to Aetna for all medical and behavioral health services? Um, 
Thank you very much for answering that question. I will want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. So I'll get the information and share it with you guys later. I think so. I think they do change. I think so too. They're asking, will parents have any choice? Could they say, oh, I want to stay with CareSource? Or... Parents have a choice <clears throat> to not go into Ohio Rise. But then they don't have access to that continuum of the Ohio Rise. Service. To that kind of reimbursement related to that. Okay. So, you know, if they don't go into Ohio Rise, then they would be eligible for some, you know, Tory's current service. Well, and also MRSS, because that's not, that's under both Medicaid rate and then also Ohio Rise. So they would get MRSS, they could get Tories, intensive something, something, whatever you want to call it, right? Right, or the family press service and all of those things. But they wouldn't get intensive care coordination. That would be what they would probably not, you know. And some of the other things that go along with it. But then I'm sorry, Rick, if they don't change, then do they lose out on a chance to be an IHBT? Is IHBT then only covered under Ohio RISE? That's correct. Okay. It's looking that way, yes. Well, at least certified IHBT, yes. Certified IHBT, yeah. Okay. So Aetna's the only MCO for Ohio RISE then. That's it. There's no correct. other. That is correct. That was the intention of Medicaid right from the beginning. It was a major um, part of their entire plan to revamp these services. Um, I have another question. I'm sorry if I'm asking too many questions. Um, but I was just wondering as far as like when you were talking about the hybrid program, can you I mean, outside of creating a new hybrid program, can you still have like a clinician who might be master's level, who is still QMHS because they haven't passed their tests yet, like still bill IHPT or it has to be under a hybrid program? So you're talking about a person with a master's who's dependently yeah. licensed? Yeah. They qualify now. Mm -hmm. So I could have someone who has a master's degree but isn't licensed bill IHBT now? They have a master's in something else? They have to have a license, yeah. Sorry, what was that? They do have to have a license. It might, yeah, it might, right. yeah, for the current model, we have a mix of bachelor and master's but they have to have at least a license, like an LSW license. Right, right. But I'm talking about like under new rules. Uh, so can you give me the example? So master's in what? So she has a master's in, count, uh, it's master's in counseling, I believe. Um, so she's license eligible. She just hasn't passed the test yet. So... And I know we talked about interns too, under the new rules, being able to build IHBT. So I was just wondering if that could just still be under IHBT mm -hmm. or if we had to create a, this hybrid program, because that sounds like it's gonna be a little bit more work with mm -hmm. an reality review. Let me get clarity on that because you know we're, we're including interns now and I just gotta make sure that the language supports exactly what you just said, but it should. Okay. I'm not saying it does. I'm saying it should. So if it doesn't exist in that way right now, we need to make it happen somehow. Okay. Thank you. Rick, this is Diane Gable from Foundations. Is there a way you guys can send out the steps to do um, Fidelity, to get Fidelity certified again? So sure. those of us who aren't Fidelity certified can... We'll do that, Diane. That up this fall. Thank you. Hi, Rick. This is Heather. My video is not working. Um, Aetna had mentioned only opening up or changing over from CareSource to Aetna once per month, which would then slow down us getting clients in. Did that change? Or are they still only doing the enrollments once a month? 
Thank you, Heather. Um, well, no, thank you, Diane, for your very succinct and answerable question. You're welcome. I was now waiting for a while. Gonna, <laughs> next, I'm gonna go on to Heather's question. <laughs> thank you, Heather, for asking. That's a great question. Um, I think I have the answer. So that's under discussion right now, Heather, and you are correct. Right now it's monthly transition between you know, like a care source and a Aetna. Having said that, um, there is very, very strong advocacy going on um, that leads me to believe that they're going to implement a rolling um, eligibility uh, for Ohio Rice. So I am hopeful, though it's not been changed yet, that that will change to rolling versus monthly. Seems like it almost has to. If they're going to identify these kids as the highest risk, most needy, you can't be like you have to wait to the 17th of next month. Which is our concern as well right. as yours. Yeah. Okay. You. Also, the updates in the age range, 5 to 18, instead of up to 21. So they cut down those couple years. Is that correct? So no 19-year-olds, no 20-year-olds for IHBT? I'm looking. I didn't know that they made that change. I didn't either. It's in your PowerPoint, Bobby. <laughs> uh. The basics PowerPoint? What PowerPoint are you talking about? Uh, the one you just sent out. Oh, you mean it's not a PowerPoint. It's in the handout? Yeah, handout. Okay. Uh, don't worry about those handouts. Yeah, they are okay. adjusted constantly. And actually, we had a second question about that, Rick. I'm going to share. Under the age, it's under the age of 21, guys, in the rule. Okay. Still, okay. And then it says four to six hours a week for IHBT, and Fidelity currently is three. Will it go up to four for minimum? Okay. So those documents are meant to help differentiate between services. They are not fidelity tools and they're not rule tools. They're like best practice tools. So four okay. to six would be kind of best practice and for three sure. is the minimum. So three is acceptable. Gotcha, thank you. And then another question uh, they had on this particular screen uh, is about needing a full-time um, supervisor for programs. And it implies here that if you had two full-time clinicians, you'd need a full-time supervisor. But currently in our own fidelity model, you have to be half time if you have two, and by the time you hit four workers, you have to be a full time supervisor. Kim, is that correct? Pretty much. Yeah, and so, so we don't. Again, this is best practice. Um, yeah, there, there's some variations sometimes depending on staff, but you know we, yeah. So, so just pay attention right now to the rule, to the Ohio Rise. Um, Whatever ODM puts out um, on their website as it relates to Ohio Rise is the most current stuff. Um, and that's what I would be paying attention to. This is, these are just help, you know, we thought they might be helpful, but they might be confusing. So um, anything we can do to, um, to blur your thinking on this is really, really helpful. <laughs> I know, we really hope this would be helpful. It's hard, this is hard. Um, and then Cassie Oliver with NIAP is asking um, the hybrid model, the hybrid IHBT model that'll be coming out, can they have a mixed caseload? And the answer is no, it's still gonna be, if you're involved in IHBT, you should be wholly involved in IHBT. We have a little wiggle room in that for, uh, particularly for licensed people who uh, do other things occasionally. But in general, if you're in that program, it's gonna have the same kind of on-call requirements and you know rapid response sort of um, expectations. And so now they can't really be doing other jobs. So Bobby, the struggle that we, so we have an intensive in-home program and that's what we were thinking about moving that over to this program. The yeah. struggle that we have is we have some 
cases that are getting referred by children's services where the child is two or three. And it's really the parent is really the one who needs the extra support. So that's where we're gonna be in a position where we're gonna have to figure out which way to go. Because as a toddler, they don't meet the requirements for the IHBT. Correct. We have an early childhood program that does the same thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big problem seeing them as an IHBT client family, um, but the, yeah, the edges of those parameters uh, don't always get dictated by us. And, um, and it's one of those cases where uh, you would have to have, not every IHBT team can work with the toddler. Uh, you know, you have to have some early childhood expertise and uh, ability to manage that. And so I'd love to say, you know, I support you in making that argument as long as you can say that they're duly um, trained to deal with both the family IHBT kinds of issues and the client early childhood issues. So um, in, in similar way that we think about it with kids on the spectrum, with Mike and his ICT, the co-occurring with substance use, that sort of thing. But I don't see that happening quickly. And um, at the moment, we'll have to go along with their age parameters that they have. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. It's been so fun so far. Anybody got some more easy questions for us? Um, I just wanted to ask a question following on Tracy's about the supervisor. Yeah. Um, so are they saying for the IHBT fidelity, it's two master's level full-time staff, or is that master's and bachelor's, but they're licensed? Well, now you're getting into those tiers. And so the original model was um, mas master's level cl licensed clinicians, period. You could have two or more, and that's a team. Um, are are you asking, Rach, are you asking about supervision of those staff? Um, no, just if the staff need to be master's level or not. Got it, got it. So then you'd be in that second tier where we where they are allowed to not have a be licensed master's level clinician, but you're in a different tier. Um, very similar to what's going on and they'll have likely shared caseloads since you have to have your mm -hmm. licensed clinician doing the family therapy. Right, okay. All right, just... That helps. Thank Unless you. you knock it all the way down to the, the third tier where um, they will have more structured interventions that they're going to be doing with the family. And um, because you, we have to face facts, we do not have a workforce out there in all of our counties and regions who have enough master's level clinicians to do this. And so we're trying to figure out some way to support those areas, um, knowing that it's, it's not going to happen immediately. Mm -hmm. Plus okay. the tears and trying to accommodate that. And so what you're talking about will exist, but it's going to be at different tier and reimbursement levels. Okay. All right, thanks. Michael Fox. <clears throat> Michael wants to know, can you get ESPN in tier three? <laughs> Only Michael Fox. Thanks, Mike. Um, Caitlin's also asking uh, if we have a minute, can we talk about the CANS training? Do you have a specific question about the CANS training, Caitlin? I was just going to ask, like previously, we could just log, you know, log into the website, take the training, and you're done. So, <laughs> sort of, sort of. I mean, you had to take the training, then get certified. You had to take the test. And yes meet the requirement 80 percent i can't remember Maybe. yeah so now they need to go to the zoom booster 
Is that over Zoom? Yeah, okay. everything's, everything's virtual. They're using Zoom. Um, if you're already certified, then you can do a booster and flip over to the newer version of the cans. If you're not certified, you would have to go through several steps of sort of oh. introductory orientation stuff. But the, the bottom line is, Kaylin, that for now, that, um, that website, that Prade Foundation website is still going to be the place where you go for the majority of your CANS training needs. Um, and, but we are getting other trainers up and running so that if you need in-person training for some reason and or you need some support because you have people who are having trouble passing the certification, uh, we expect to be able to assist with that. Okay, so the Zoom trainings are only if you need an extra support. Nope. All the trainings on Pray Ed are going to be by by Zoom. Okay. Uh, yep. So, so that this is different than what's been happened before. So, if you knew how to do the cans, you could just jump on and get certified, right? And you, this that's no longer the case. So, ODM, OMAS, and Prayed have said you have to now go through these new training set of trainings and then get certified. You can't even get certified until you have registered and gone through the training. So it's changed. If you're already certified, like Bobby said, you just have to do the booster. Then you can jump on and get certified at your next date of certif recertification. And uh, Rebecca's asking, uh, can they still do those trainings for free? So Rebecca, the, the trainings you, that you can get online from Prad are, are still, you can log into those and get those for free. You, you do have to register though and pay for ultimately going through the certification process. It remains at a very low or affordable price. Actually, oh. actually, actually. Uh -oh. New, new. For a limited time, on a limited time only, Ohio is offering you certification for the cans for free. So not only do you get the training, you also get the certification. Limited time only. Call in now to get access to this offer. Should we put Rick's cell phone number on the screen to call? So it's a year. So between now and July, um, it's free. Rick, do we have any updates on the CME process? Not a one. What do you want to know? I want to know when they're going to put it out. When it's no. going to look like. We don't know yet. I have not heard an update on that. I mean, I thought it would be out by now. They're keeping their cards very close to their chest in that one. They are. This is Renee. I have a question about discharging clients with all this, like this insurance stuff that's changing. Um, since IHPT is so short term, and sometimes we step kids down to a lower level of care, are the other insurance companies going to do rolling, like enrollment, so then they can access those less than 10 services at discharge? Okay, Bobby, we need to mute. Great Renee. question. Yeah. We just need to permanently mute her for the rest of this session. I, I think Nicole and I are kicked out. We're not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if Renee didn't ask, I was going to ask. So, you know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. So let's write that one down and get an answer for you. It's a good one. I don't know. It is. And, um, ugh. Uh, I, so it's so many levels of that question, like can, so Aetna's the pick for the MCO for Ohio Rise, but can they be the MCO anyway, if the kid, you know, it no. gets reduced? Nope. Oh, Rick says no. He thinks no on that one. That's all they're authorized for. Yeah. Yeah. So then it would have to switch to somebody else. Um it's almost like they think that kids are going to stay at that level of distress, but that negates what we're attempting to do, right? I mean, we're hoping that they are successfully transitioned out of these intensive models into something that's more sustainable as they make progress. 
but it's hard to get them out. It's like Vegas hotel or, you know, Vegas casino. You like, you can get in, but you can't get out. It's um, hotel California. Right. I think the yeah. other piece of it that, that is ironic and complicated is that uh, we're asking families who may not be that good at navigating systems to constantly be navigating systemic change. And I think that we're going to see a lot of people who just fall through the cracks as a result of that, which is really disappointing to, to sort of think that we're setting them up. So I, I think, um, you know, even though I can't answer those questions, you know, right now, I think the reality is, is that the ICC folks, the intensive care coordinators, the moderate care coordinators are supposed to help navigate all of that. And I think the answers will be known in the next, you know, six months. Um, you guys are asking, as I thought you might, some rather complicated questions about rolling enrollment and things like that. And so for us to help you help families navigate, you know, we need more information ourselves. Um, but by the time we get to July, that is what ICC and MCC are supposed to do. They're supposed to help families navigate uh, in and out of their services and in and out of Ohio Rise and all of those things. So I am hoping that that won't be a barrier um, moving forward. Couple more questions that have popped up. Um, will there be a different fidelity review to add interns to your IHBT team or do interns have to be on a different team? The idea is that interns will be allowed to be included again. I'm not sure when that goes into effect, whether they're waiting for the whole Ohio rise lift, all these changes we've been working on in the rules mm -hmm. or whether they will be implemented anytime sooner. So it's hard to tell. But the idea is that the interns are part of your established IHBT teams. They aren't a separate team or different somehow just because of their intern status. Um, uh, it's going to be July 1st until we know otherwise. Okay. The so IHBT assume team. that. Mm -hmm. And then um, is it correct that regardless of the type or tier of IHBT team, uh, there has to be a full-time dedicated supervisor? And the short answer to that is you always have to have a dedicated supervisor. They don't have to be full-time until you hit four people on your team. So they start it, uh, you have to, a team is not one person. So a team has to be two providers and a supervisor. And at that point, they could be half-time supervision. Um, but by the time you add two more people to your team, they would have to be up at a full-time dedication. Um, going back to an earlier question, um, and I yeah. forget if it was... Renee or Nicole or someone else. Um, I'm reading the rule as we're talking because that's what we do. That's how good we are. We're gonna read the rule to give you simultaneous feedback. So the rule says license eligible in it. So it says license or license eligible. Um, so that's gonna be not a problem moving forward. I'll start when the new rules start. I'd have to check the other rule to see what's in that, to see if license eligible is in there. So I will do that in our remaining minute. Okay, because I don't currently add her into our fidelity review because she's not licensed. So, and we're not billing IHBT because she's not licensed. So that's why I asked. I think it's a wonderful question. Um, I had one more quick question. So, Are you guys like professional questioners? I apparently am. <laughs> um, so for, for the new phone call rule as well, we're going to be able to bill phone calls to collaterals. Um, yes. That will start July 22 as well. We're not going to be starting that anytime sooner. Well, you're doing it now. Through telehealth, yep. technically. But so yeah. as long as the telehealth rule is in place, you can do that. Okay. I just did, but they were, my agency just wanted to ask if like those rules were going to go into effect sooner than July of 2022, but it looks like it's not. Yeah. I mean, so the question is, 
around telehealth. I mean, there's bigger questions around what the this counselor social worker board is allowing as well. Um, my understanding is you can still build telehealth as of today, and I don't know that it's going away. The question, and it's a separate rule, and that went, I want to say that they put that into a permanent rule. So I have to double check on that. But IHBT is included in that. All right, folks, we are at the end of our hour. And I think we're walking away with more questions to look into than we actually answered. But I, this is what we have to do. We're all in this together and we have to figure out what do we need to know to keep moving forward. So um, I super appreciate everybody's being here and your questions. I have recorded this. So if there are people who weren't able to see all of these things, um, we'll get that link back out to you. Rebecca's tossing in another, so did Cassie, another question. How many staff to move to two supervisors and can the supervisor be supervising the different tiers? Uh, to date, and Kim can correct me if I'm wrong, you can have up to eight um, providers under one full-time supervisor. So if you exceed eight, um, then the, I think you're stressing your supervisor if you have eight full-time people, but uh, that's the rule at the moment and Kim's nodding. And then regarding supervisors, four total people require full-time uh, supervisor or four licensed staff. It'd be total people if you get into those tiers and mixes because the number of cases go up regardless of whether they're licensed or not because they're partnering. Um, so two LSW staff and two QHMS staff, Fidelity would require a full-time supervisor. And I would also question whether you could actually be doing IHBT since you don't have anyone who's actually qualified to do family therapy with that mix. Anyway, we can get the fidelity for the IHBT hybrid, not yet, but we'll be working on it. I hope it comes out this winter. It will not be, um, we're not gonna spring it on you in July, okay? The, um, the fidelity for the hybrid, but we're still, we're still negotiating all the details of it. So it doesn't do us any good to put anything out on it yet because it, it changes, it's shifting. Um, high fidelity wrap training. Uh, I know that's a thing. I don't know if Rick has a... Sure. Um, I'm busy reading the old IHBT rule so that Rachel, <laughs> not Rachel, Renee and Nicole can go home feeling good about themselves. Um, so... Uh, wraparound training will be happening. Um, is uh, was that Eve? Yeah. So, um, wraparound training um, will be happening in earnest, um, starting probably in October. Again, we offer it year round. Um, having said that, we're going to tailor it to the new intensive care coordination and then moderate care coordination. Um, positions. And so we're modifying the trainings to address that. Um, and they should be ready for October-ish. Um, if you have questions about that, we'll be putting them on the Wraparound Ohio website. You can always email me. I usually know when they're going to be uh, rolled out. So what we want to do in the next 30 days is put out year-long training schedules for Wraparound, for MRSS, for IHBT, um, et cetera. Um, so look, look for those um, on our, our website, but we'll, we'll, we always send it to you guys regardless. All right, folks, I think we're gonna have to bring this party to a close. If you have additional questions, if you hang up and think, oh, why didn't I ask this? email me. We, this is our job. We are digging for answers. We're trying to stabilize things. We're trying to make sure that we can all keep doing what we know is effective and efficient with our families. And, um, and we do it with you and for you. So you need to let us know what you're struggling with and what you still don't understand. 
and we will keep letting you know what we're struggling with and still don't understand or can't get a final response on yet. But that's what we're here for. We'll see you next month. And in the meantime, um, let us know what you need to know. You guys be safe out there. Have a great week and uh, keep doing what you're doing. We need it. Thanks. You guys Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.